Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our last session uh, for today. Um, we'll just give it a maybe just one more minute uh, while we just wait for a few more people to turn up. Uh, as we wait, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat box and where you're dialing in from, feel free to do so. Hey, Abby and Becky, dialing from Edinburgh. <laughs> Emma from Edinburgh also, of course. <laughs> Gabriel from London. Awesome. Stuart also from Edinburgh. Getting a, a really good, strong Scottish contingency tonight, <laughs> which is really, really lovely. Uh, Well, not to hold this back, uh, I say we get started and then um, more and more people will join, I believe. Um, but welcome everyone to today's event called The Starving Artist, Change Making Through Art Activism. Uh, tonight, uh, this event is part of a series event taking place for I Will Week, where this year our theme is pulling together for youth social action. Um, my name is Tony, I'm the youth leadership manager here through I Will. Uh, and I'm glad that each and every one of you are joining us this evening. Uh, and you're in for a real treat. It's a interactive workshop from what I can tell from the brief uh, and the download uh, that I've received from your host today. Uh, and tonight you are in for a sweet treat. Uh, Ali, will, our I Will Ambassador from 2021 will be guiding you through the session. So I'm just gonna pass it over to Ali and yeah. Looking forward to being immersed into what you're going to be sharing with us tonight. Oh, thank you so much, Tony. And hi there, everyone. My name's Ali. Um, I'm from Toronto, Canada, but been in sunny, not sunny, Glasgow for a very, very long time now. And um, I lecture at the University of Glasgow and I teach um, many things, but arts research is kind of where I'm at. And I'm the founder of The Starving Artist. So I'll tell you all about that today. And hopefully you guys um, will learn a little bit more about art activism. So I'll just get right into it then. Forgive me while I just switch screens. And just checking, can everyone see it? Yes. Yes, yes. okay, perfect, thank you so much. All right, so um, I guess so we'll start right at the beginning of my story. So for such a long time, I thought if I was thinner, I'd be happier. But the opposite occurred and I became confined to my body with an eating disorder for over 10 years. Now, while the number on the scale got really, really low, I think my life at that point was really, really difficult. My hair was falling out. I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs. I had heart palpitations. Life was really bad for me. And I couldn't speak to anyone about this. My family was traditional Eastern European, and so mental health did not come up in our daily conversations. And I found that medical practitioners saw a diagnosis, didn't see someone like me suffering from a disease. So it just left me incredibly alone. What I tried to do was explore my experiences through visual art as a way for me to process and understand what I was going through. So really my position as someone who's lived with an eating disorder for over 10 years, wanted for me a way to, I think, authentically engage and show what it's actually like to be someone suffering from a disease. And what this led me to do was start The Starving Artist. So The Starving Artist is among many things. It's um, at its core, it's an artist initiative. And really it's focusing on championing lived in voices of mental illnesses from eating disorders to body dysmorphia to even just depression and suicide. We really want to give a platform for people to, I believe, engage and talk about what they're going through. And I think for us, art is at the core of what we're doing. So we do many different times of art engagement. So we do publications, exhibitions, workshops, collaborations, even with schools and healthcare facilities. 
I think what we're trying to do is use visual art as a way to engage in different sectors and try to motivate people to look at these topics through an alternative lens. So on the bottom right, that was when I was able to get artworks throughout um, the UK on billboards. So it's really trying to take these private conversations of mental illness, eating disorders, and I think just well-being and bring them into the forefront of our daily lives. So these billboards would be outside your local doctor's office or your local grocery store and really trying to make you think more about your individual actions. I think more so than we would in our normal daily lives. And then also at the top one, I had the chance to meet Prince William through the Diana Legacy Award. And um, he is actually very quite tall in person, but he's also someone who is really supportive of the arts as a way for him, as someone who is a political leader, to engage more deeply in these topics. What we were talking about mainly is how art can give voice behind numbers. When you hear that one in 10 people are dealing with an eating disorder throughout the UK, we don't know what it's like to be each one of those people but art is a way for us to better understand and see what people are going through. Now, the research that we are trying to do and I think communicate to the public is focusing on how we can use our autoethnographic experiences to help those outside of ourselves understand what we're going through. Um, also, autoethnographic is just a fancy term that means self-reflection or just self-investigation. So what I've been using autoethnographic research for is my own position as an artist and researcher and activist. So I really tried to explore my own experiences and process them through art. Now the work that we've been doing is amazing because it helps both those with lived in experience better understand what they're going through, but then see their voices authentically represented. Um, I'll talk more about this later on, but I think what the key thing is, is that it's no longer from people outside of the illness saying what it's like to be someone suffering. Instead, what we're trying to do is make it more authentic and genuine about what it's like to live with mental health. So some of the activities that we do, like um, exhibitions and publications, these help fund the Star Starving Artist Scholarship Fund. So this is a way for us to engage more directly and help, I think, people access inpatient treatment resources because often there's either very little space in public facilities or people just aren't sick enough and there's very little way for people to have preemptive care. So the Starving Artist is a way to help those in financial need access these resources. So when we think about eating disorders, there's tends to be two ways that come to mind and they're, both of them are very, very stereotypical. On the far left, we see a thin white girl and she's too thin to function. You can see how um, she's young. It's normally in movies like a girl who's trying to starve herself to lose weight for prom, you know, eating carrot sticks and on a treadmill. That's when we think about an eating disorder. And then on the other side of it is the very other stereotypical representation, which is um, someone who's too large to function and they have no control around food. You're just seen as someone who's trying to indulge. Now, while these two could be actually very real cases, and they are throughout the world, they're not the only voices that need to be heard. People all over the world are experiencing eating disorders in very different and very profound ways. We need to have more conversations about age, ethnicity, intersectionality of mental health, and then even just looking at people and in their individual experiences, because no two are alike. Whenever we see movies or TV, or even just within our daily conversations, these are the two voices that keep on being repeated. And then what the starving artist tries to do is counteract these stereotypical representations. So we do so by providing artistic voices that show both the internal experiences and the external. So no longer is it just focusing on the physical body, but really showing that mind body relationship of what someone's experiencing. And then also we try to counteract that outsider perspective. Media outlets are probably one of the biggest culprits for this, but even healthcare practitioners. Inside the NHS handbook for um, the diagnostics of all um, mental health conditions, under anorexia, it says when your patient is suffering, she will normally be displaying these symptoms, blah, blah, blah. But just even the using word she is highly problematic because that's limiting half the population who are all very prone to having eating disorders. And that's right here in the UK. So what we tried to do is showcase the diversity of voices and their visual art expression.
Now, just going into some of my work and my personal journey, I want to talk a little bit more about that voice that isn't heard. And hopefully you guys can see through my art. What I've tried to do is, I think, illuminate on that dark reality that we don't talk about. So when we think about mental health, it's often a very stereotypical lens. But for me, one of the things that I find incredibly difficult is processing anxiety around my eating disorder. So there's been days where I could even get out of bed because I would have panic attacks, or I just need that feeling of being small and just cry in a closet because I don't want the world to hurt me anymore. And while someone may say, oh, I felt incredibly bad yesterday and I couldn't get out of bed, you don't understand or really feel what they're going through. But when you see a painting like this, hopefully you can emphasize more and I think engage more at a personal level about what someone's going through. Now, these ones are called euphoria. And for me, um, like many people with eating disorders, food is a source of control. Having the choice to eat or not to eat is giving you, I think, an agency or an outlet to take control over your lives. Um, this painting was done in my um, early high school years. And I think for me, what happened was I had no control in my life. I had parents that were getting divorced, so much schoolwork. I had to work two jobs to afford the school. And every single day I'd come home. And the one thing that I sought comfort in was a box of Cheerios. Hopefully you guys have Cheerios in the UK, but basically they're just like this really bland cereal. But for me in that moment, just eating cereal took me to a place and helped me escape from my daily problems. Now, eating disorders, again, can be very serious, but I also want to show the lighthearted nature of it. So when we talk about a very serious topic like this, we can also look at it through a comical and I think alternative perspective. Now, these works are called Popping Pills and Popping Bills, and it's looking both at the internal and external influence of eating disorders. So while not everyone can relate to this, I think that some people who themselves are chronically ill or know someone that is may relate. Um, for me, I had a lot of um, eating disorder pills that I tried to take. You know, the ones that help reduce your meta or improve your metabolism or green tea pills or ones to help um, burn calories or ones to help with um, trying to have a higher metabolic rate. Whatever the pills were, I just kept taking them all. And then I ended up having to take more pills because I had anxiety and depression. And really at that point, I was just consumed. So you can see here how both it became a secret, but then also the inability to escape. And I really became consumed by this. I was really trying to look at these private elements that nobody really talks about when we think of eating disorders or even mental health and try to give that public an image about what it's actually like to suffer behind closed doors. So these ones are called bones and flesh. And for me, when I think of my eating disorder, it's not always a dark element, but what I originally was drawn to with my eating disorder or really fell into was the company and comfort. I found that when I couldn't control the external world, I tried to control it from within. And my eating disorder was a way for me to, I think, have a companion throughout everything I was going through. Either eating a slice of cake or try not to eat for days and days. It was a way for me to, I think, process and handle what was going on. It was a terrible coping mechanism, but it became more than that. It became all consuming. So this is kind of a manifestation of the eating disorder. And at first it's kind of like a romance where you slowly start to invest and learn more about the person. But then in this painting, you can see how it can consume you and you lose yourself and your identity to the illness. Now, <laughs> I won't show you too much art for right now, but what I want you to know is that art, while beautiful, it can also have a message and help to the public. So what I've been trying to do is take the starving artists across the world and be able to bring voice to what it's like to have an eating disorder. So I've shared my voice and over 25 international artists. And what we've been able to do is promote more authentic representations of what it's like to live in an unwell body. So some of these have been right here in Scotland, but others have been in the um, 
in the Netherlands, Brazil. We've also have one coming up in Taiwan. It's been amazing to get the work out there. And I think it's more likely that we're able to have conversations when we have art as a base to start. Now, art, again, is one of those things that should not just be limited to these gallery walls. Art is an amazing way for us to engage with others. So I've been able to have um, cross-cultural conversations using art because art has been an amazing way to overcome language barriers and build a mutual foundation with people. And at the same time, art can engage in different sectors when we're looking at um, things beyond eating disorders, such as um, just mental health in general, climate activism, migrant experiences. Art is a way to communicate your personal journey and your voice. Now, while this talk is brief, I just want to show you guys um, a couple key takeaways. So first off, I don't think we should shy away from art in our health treatment. Art is an amazing tool for us to process and really investigate within ourselves and understand our feelings through a different and I think more profound lens. When we're looking at mental health conversations, I think it's also important that we champion that we handle these with the utmost care and compassion. These are very, very serious conversations, but I think art is a way for us to facilitate them in a nurturing way and a little more vulnerably as well. I think also one thing that as um, someone with lived in experience is that we should have people who have this experience to be at the forefront of these conversations. It shouldn't no longer, or it shouldn't really be those who are doctors or um, researchers being the ones to decide what is the best treatment for individuals. As individuals, we're experts on ourselves. And I think it's important that we find what works best for us, but then also look at recovery through a dialogue. So working with mental health practitioners, not having them work for individuals. And that kind of brings me to my next point, which is that mental illnesses do not make us disabled. We're still able to effectively contribute to healthcare communities and I think make actual change within the world. Now for you guys, um, I'm not sure if anyone is an artist, but for me, I found my passion through art, but that's not the only way that you can make change in the world. I think what it's important for you guys to do is find what you're most passionate about and use that as the way you make change. So whether it be baking, poetry, sports, whatever it be, use that voice to guide the way that you want to help the world. Um, if you're passionate about it, I feel like there's always going to be an audience because someone will also relate to what you're going through. And this part will be the next one that we'll be going into for a workshop, but we'll be using and exploring our personal journeys and voices to make a difference in our change making efforts. So I think it's important that we highlight individual stories because they really help one reduce the stereotypes of what is being told, but instead showing more authentic and general or vulnerable ways of looking at these topics. And then the last part is again, focusing on having genuine bonds with people. And by doing so through art or even just sharing what you're struggling with, it's I think making more effective communication because it's no longer just um, quotes that have been repeated or stereotypical numbers that are being told. Instead, it's a real person experiencing what they're going through and sharing it to someone else. So while this talk is brief, hopefully we can continue on into the next workshop session. But I just want to check if there's any questions so far. None? Okay, <laughs> we're good for time then. Well, I will share my desktop and we'll go on to part two. So today we'll be looking more at the power of portraits. Um, for me, I like I said, I love doing autoethnographic art. And today you guys will be the ones who are at the forefront of the art making. So today we'll be looking at experiences. So you can see through the way that I've been exploring my voice in art, I think it's important that we look at individual experiences to look at mental health through different lenses. So, one thing that I hope that we can do is look more so at our daily actions. So looking either at the mundane or looking at things that we wouldn't normally reflect on, but using art as a space to explore them more. So hopefully today you can look at maybe exploring your memories or stories to create a strong message about what you want to communicate to the world. 
So I'm just giving some examples to help inspire you guys, but these ones are called Voices Behind Bodies. And this is one that I did when I was trying to process external dialogue with internal. So basically, <laughs> there was so many people trying to say how I should have recovered or how I should go about um, my diet plan or how should I go about even just having a job or career or what I should be doing to clean up my flat. There was too many voices that I found completely consuming. And what I tried to do was show the self versus the externalness and showing how it was causing a lot of inner torment and often it was debilitating. Now the next ones, I again, I just want to touch on that isolation factor and showing the pain and what people are going through. So um, these ones are called, this one is crying in the closet and this one is tear stain like ink. So really trying to look at mental breakdowns and look at taking that private element and bringing it into the public what I want people to understand through these paintings is that there's a lot of pain and suffering that goes beyond or behind closed doors that I think get neglected. So really trying to humanize what eating disorders are. Now, these ones are looking at that daily act and trying to, I think, explore these in a deeper way. So um, the one on the left is me eating ice cream while working out on a bike. And so it's that cycle within an eating disorder of trying to burn calories, but at the same time trying to eat because you really want to eat. And so it was a cyclical process, but a really excruciating one. I had to work out for hours <laughs> to burn off ice cream that takes five minutes to eat. And so it's really trying to explore that I think small topic that now has a platform to actually be heard. And then on the right, it's looking at um, a grocery shop line. And this painting is called, um, it's more common than you think. And it's looking at how eating disorders come in many different forms. So this was when I was going through a very long and difficult period with binge eating disorders. So I would just buy a bunch of ice cream. Okay, I love ice cream, but um, this was when I would just have way too much of it. So all I would eat the whole entire day would be ice cream. And then the person next to me was going through the exact same thing, but they were having um, Greek yogurt with honey. So it's trying to look at saying one, eating disorders aren't just isolated in the private, but it's within our daily lives and making us reflect on, wait a minute, there's so many different ways that an eating disorder can be experienced. Personally, I think everybody has some form of disordered eating because there's no one right way to eat. And I think that some people, you know, when they get stressed, they'll eat a whole pizza or some people that are stressed and they don't eat at all. Or there are some people that want a bite of everything or other people only want to eat one thing. So really it's just trying to show that <laughs> eating disorders are one just vast and profound, but also we need to have more voices heard because these aren't being talked about as often. So now it's time for your turn to create artworks. So whatever supplies you have in your house, whether it be a pen and paper or an iPad or um, markers, you'll spend the next 20 minutes, just turn off your screen and just have, I think, time to explore and create an artwork. The only criteria is trying to make a portrait of yourself and think about one of your memories or stories that you want to share or just create an artwork about. I think this is trying to focus on something that you want to bring to the public or something that you feel like you haven't had time to process. So we'll come back in maybe about 20 minutes and you guys can I think just take this time, reflect, create art. It's not gonna be put in a museum or gallery. It's just something for you to use as a tool and just try out today. Um, is there any questions so far? No? Okay. Well, I'll give you guys the time right now and then we'll meet back maybe at, it's 5.30, so 5.48, 5.45, 5 5.45, okay. Perfect. I'll put up the screen as well so you guys can just have that there.
when you're ready, feel free to turn your cameras back on or just give us a little thumbs up emoji. Just want to check that Ali is still there. Cool. We're on time. We're on time. So I'm just going to pull up the second part of the um, workshop slide. But does anybody want to share what they made during the time? I will share. I, I am not an artist, but hopefully you can see this OK. So I have put myself as an octopus. Um, because in my life and in my role, I have so many different. I'm a mother, I'm also a colleague, I'm a friend. I'm a partner, but I'm also me. And sometimes they have all different conflicting um, elements on my time and all the different tentacles that I hold. So when I think about a self-portrait, I always think of myself a bit like an octopus. That's amazing. I love that. It's almost like, um, what do you call it? Like you have the buckets of life. You can only pour so much energy into each of those. And I see that with you just trying to like, manage everything and that's just such a great representation of how stressful life can be dealing with so much <laughs> but also at the same time it's a bit of a happy octopus because you know within each of those bits that, that there's lots of joy and there's lots of excitement and there's lots of new learning and fun it's just at times having that balance within it as well yeah that's amazing especially being able to handle all that too with a smile it props to you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Does anyone else want to share what they've been working on? I'll go. Again, I don't know. I didn't really draw me because I can't I, I can't draw. Um so I, I how visible is that gonna be? Actually. Oh dear. Focus. Focus. Oh god. You can't really see it very well. Well ish. Basically, what that's meant to be, <laughs> I'll keep zooming in, I'll, I'll hold it back. What that's meant to be is that's me there. And basically, as a kind of thought bubble, what that is, and you're lucky you can't see it very well, but just imagine it's drawn to perfection. That's that's a light switch um, that's got an out of order sign around it um, because quite often I find it very difficult to switch my mind off. Um, and so that's meant to symbolize my mind and that no matter how much I try to kind of switch off sometimes the light switch just isn't working and it's it's got an out of order sign around it and it's not working so no matter how much I try I can't quite switch off certain emotions that I've got or certain kind of issues or struggles that I've had and it's, it's kind of always been there and it's always kind of lingered so I'm going to struggle with that so that's meant to be a light switch with an out of order sign around it in a thought bubble that's amazing. Did you think maybe doing art actually helped you to switch off for a little bit? I think, yeah, it, it, it feels good sometimes to get, to kind of get something down on paper, you know, whether, yeah, whether that's, whether that's words or, or even just kind of doodling the waist. I don't know. There's something, something quite therapeutic about just you know, if, if it's turmoil in your mind or stress, it just even even if you're just writing that stress out or drawing that stress out on paper, there's something quite cathartic and quite healing. I think about it, even though I, I'm I'm not I'm not a big I'm not a big artist. I'm not a drawer at all, clearly. Um, but just that kind of process, and like you said earlier, whether that's whatever different kind of outlet that may be, I think sometimes just getting that kind of struggle out in some form is quite yeah quite therapeutic. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, this actually brings me to the questions that I want to raise as to the group. So um, I'll share my screen. But does anyone want to share maybe what this experience has taught you, whether it be maybe wanting to look at art or maybe try to look at how you're processing your feelings? Uh, I'm happy to jump in. <clears throat> um, this experience, so I was really struggling when I, you said the task, and I was like, I really hate drawing because I, um, I like don't think of myself as being very good at art. And then I thought, actually, that I, I really enjoy being creative in other ways. Um, and then when you kind of gave some different options, and you're like, oh, if you have an iPad, then you can do something that. And I was like, I'm going to make something on Canva. 
And then I just like, because I that's like, I like making like little playlists, covers and that kind of stuff on Canva. I, I love Canva. <laughs> it's my, it's my baby with presentations. <laughs> yeah. So I just, um, yeah, I made some art on Canva and like, it was really a useful experience to expose me to actually, I can do things like art therapy and yeah, use art as a creative process, even though. I don't like I like the thing that I struggle with is being like I've got a vision of what I want to put on the page but then I don't have the skills to do it and then actually it's really nice when I can do something like Canva or like any like a kind of more techy thing and be like oh this is a really nice way where I can visualize and express myself creatively mm-hmm. without having the frustration that uh yeah I can't draw um so that was really nice for me I love that. And especially because it's like, I, I remember always wanting to be a musician, but my music teacher kicked me off of like 13 different instruments. <laughs> so I realized that maybe I need to find something that worked better for me. And I found painting, but not everybody has the same, I think, interest or just ways that they want to explore it. So yes, I love that you even use Canva for this. So thank you so much. Does anyone else want to add to this point? No? Okay. Well, we go on to the next one then. So what was tough about this? Other than, I think, challenging your artistic skills. I think, sorry, um, I think for me, one of the difficulties is just that we as humans find it very difficult to articulate or even, you know, even show in any way any kind of weakness or any kind of struggle. There's that kind of natural kind of tendency I think a lot of people have just to kind of bottle it up so I suppose kind of getting over that barrier and you know even even when I found that there so what was tough about me as much as I I showed my drawing and, and I kind of did the whole light switch analogy there's still that I, I opened up to a certain level but I didn't I didn't share what the issues were that I was kind of dealing with so there's there's still that you know that's still tough so it obviously it would be a gradual thing but I think yeah the thing I found tough is just kind of exposing some of that vulnerability because I feel we're quite naturally inclined just not to. Exactly. I think, yeah, like what I was going through is that I've always thought of my mental health as a weakness. And so then I don't want to admit that I'm weak and that I'm suffering with something. And so what I tried to do is just show instead of having to explain or tell. But then over years, I've been able to found my voice alongside being able to explore it through art. So I think absolutely. I'm glad that you're like, this is like even just the beginning steps of your journey. And I think the last one is relevant to some, but um, how does portraits maybe shape your voice or the way that you engage in a topic? especially looking at like self-reflection portraits is a way of seeing yourself but I'll let you guys kind of fill in what you guys think okay well I'll, I'll mention because I'm probably the expert on portraits at this point um I always find that by looking at myself or even just making paintings or artworks about the ways that like I perceive myself, it kind of distanced me and then makes me reflect at like past alley versus present alley. So it's always good just to like look at those moments that maybe cause you difficulty or those ones that I think challenge you and look at why did I feel that way or how can I explore this now in the present? So art is just a way that I've been able to process this. But some people may do that through music or through poetry or um, through Canva. Really, it's just so nice that you guys can hopefully think of ways that work best for you. And just to keep with time, because everyone's probably hungry this evening, I'll wrap up and say that it's so nice that you guys are able to engage in this topic and try it. I know that not everyone's artist, but thank you for going through this and exploring it. And I think just to take away is that we should be more vulnerable about mental health. Everyone has it. And I think it's going forward is that we should make more spaces to have conversations like this. So we can all, I think as a community, be able to build each other up. But thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you so much, Ali. That was Fabulous. And it's always nice to just have a moment to, you know, take pen or pencil or any sort of instrument uh, to just kind of let your brain uh, just melt and just, you know, 
like like Stuart was saying, you know, like tap into certain areas or explore certain feelings and experiences and memories that uh, that we all have. Um, exploring the mundane, the day to day, like uh, myself also being a dance artist, you know, the tough part for me is always what part do I want to expose or open up to dig into further and sometimes that's the the challenging bit is are you willing to dig into that and really let other people share your lived experience and and, and hear your voice so thank you so much it was it was lovely just to even um yeah just just a sketch and what I sketched myself was you know what was the last thing that made me felt really good and it was getting my hair cut so cut, drawing that and sketching that on paper was really lovely and just reliving those moments of you know feeling like you're being pampered and looked after a little bit I love um, that you're looking at the good and the bad and just be able to reflect on just life in general so amazing amazing <laughs> Um, so that takes us to the very end. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. And again, thank you, Ali, for uh, running such a great uh, session this evening. Uh, we hope everyone found it fun and enjoyable. And if you enjoyed uh, Ali's session tonight, this is one of the many different activities or events that we're hosting this I Will Week. Uh, and to find out more about what's going on, make sure to visit our website, www.iwill.org.uk. It's not too late to sign up to uh, other events that are happening this week. And again, if you're on social media, make sure to, you know, tag, retweet, share, uh, tell us what you're, you're getting involved with in terms of I Will Week uh, 2022. Uh, we'd love to hear about it and see about and see what you're getting up to. So that's all from us this evening. Thank you everyone for, for joining us tonight.